Welcome to Urban X Real Talk Fitness Radio News, where we bring you more than just the trending news. We bring you the news you need to know, news to assist you in making healthier choices for yourself in the hopes that you will be successful in navigating the often murky waters of the health and fitness industry. I'm your host, Tiaja. We'll be back next week with our series on aging, well, in a few weeks, but I want to share with you some thoughts regarding the other side of the climate change debate. Now, I personally don't care what side of the debate you're on, but I do care that you have an opportunity to hear both sides sides of the debate, something I believe the media is desperately trying to prevent the American public from hearing. So today I'm going to share a lecture from former Greenpeace co-founder Patrick Moore. Warning, what you're about to hear, you can't unhear. So if you're all in on the conventional narrative regarding climate change, then you might want to press stop and do not pass go. For all others, you'll find this lecture to be intellectually stimulating at best. Mr. Moore does get a bit technical in his explanations, but the little intellectual turbulence you'll experience is worth the ride. With that said, I will offer my two cents now and feel free to keep the change. Now, I've never liked anyone telling me what I could and could not do, so you can imagine how I feel about someone, anyone, telling me what I should or should not think. Moreover, I've always been extremely skeptical when those in the political agree on anything and present it as a consensus. Listen, there is no consensus without the people, and there is certainly no mandate worthy of consideration unless it empowers the people. It is Tuesday, September 10th, 2019. Let's flow. So I've decided this year to double down and to give you a full clutch of contrarians in what the uh, Financial Post has called Moses Neimer's Idea City Shocker. <laughs> this is what they say. In the wake of the G7 declaration last week in favor of global decarbonization and this week's papal encyclical on climate change, Toronto's Idea City conference staged by ideological entrepreneur Moses Neimer launches Friday, June 19th, with a carbon contrarian shocker. The three opening speakers are Patrick, quote, I'm a climate skeptic Moore, followed by fossil fuel advocate Alex Epstein, and then Lord Nigel Lawson, chairman of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. So we'll begin with Patrick. I first met Patrick about a thousand years ago when I went to Vancouver in an effort to set up a second city TV shortly after we had started the one here in Toronto. And I never did get that license, Patrick, but I stumbled into the offices of a newish organization called Greenpeace. And there I met this very charismatic guy, Bob Hunter. And he kind of drew me into their then current campaign, which was opposed to whaling. It was an amazing group of characters. There was no lack of characters in that place, but even then, Patrick Moore always seemed to be the more measured one, the more rational one. An environmental realist, Patrick Moore, who's taken a lot of hits subsequently from many old friends and a lot of new enemies because of his point of view. Patrick. Thank you, Moses, for the opportunity and what a wonderful experience I've had here. I speak on many controversial subjects, but climate is the most difficult, and Moses explained why in his little clip from last year. I was born and raised on this tiny village floating on the Pacific Ocean on the north end of Vancouver Island. There was no road. I went to school by boat every day, and this is what it looks like today from my little village cabin there that I built with my wife over 40 years ago by hand. This is the view to the north. I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver at age 14, ended up at the University of British Columbia studying the life sciences, biology, biochemistry, genetics, a little forestry. And then in the mid-60s, before the word was known to the general public, I discovered the science of ecology, the science of how all living things are interrelated and how we are related to them. At the height of the Cold War, the height of the Vietnam War, the threat of all-out nuclear war, and the emerging consciousness of the environment, I was soon transformed while doing my PhD in ecology into a radical environmental activist. Can't seem to get it to go that way anymore. 
I found myself in a church basement with a like-minded group planning a protest voyage against U.S. hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska. That's me under the P in 71. We helped change things. Just a few people stopped the hydrogen bomb testing in Alaska along with all the other people, but we were the spearhead for it. I ended up in front of harpoons out on the Pacific Ocean against the Soviet factory whaling fleets, saving the whales from slaughter. They're recovering all over the world now and sitting on baby seals and getting arrested off the east coast of Newfoundland. Why did I leave Greenpeace after 15 years? We started with a strong humanitarian perspective, save human civilization from all-out nuclear war. By the time I left, Greenpeace and much of the movement was depicting humans as the enemies of the earth. I don't buy that. Also, the sharp end of the stick was the science. My fellow directors, none of whom had any formal science education, decided we should call chlorine the devil's element and ban it worldwide. My entreaties that chlorine was in fact the most important element for public health and medicine fell on deaf ears, part of the anti-human aspect. Science is, should be the basis for environmental policy, not sensationalism, misinformation and fear. Here Greenpeace in the Philippines portraying golden rice with the skull and crossbones when in fact it could save two million children from death each year. Many opinions about climate change. 31,000 US scientists and professionals have signed this petition saying there is no evidence that we're going to cause catastrophic warming. But the Inter Intergovernmental on Panel on Climate Change says it's extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Let's just parse that for a sec. Extremely likely, is that a scientific term? And does it make it more likely to put the word extremely in front of it? The, the report before this, they had very likely. Now they've changed it to extremely likely, as if they're more certain. This is not a scientific term. It is a term of judgment. It is an opinion, in other words, when someone says something is likely. The dominant cause means somewhere between 50 and 100%. They don't have any idea, apparently, where it might be in that range. And since the mid 20th century means 1950. So they do not ascribe a major cause of warming before 1950 to human activity. The late Michael Crichton, I am certain there is too much certainty in the world. And I am certain that he is correct. This is the curve of carbon dioxide increasing in the global atmosphere since 1959 when we first started measuring it accurately. But we have proxies that go back millions of years so we know a lot about what CO2 levels have been in the past. This goes back to the beginning of the Earth, but the first part there is the first four billion years here, so let's forget about that for a minute. Here's where modern life emerged, the Cambrian explosion when multicellular life forms came into being. Before that, all life was unicellular, invisible, like microscopic, and lived in the sea. Here, life came on the land, and plants and insects uh, e evolved. At that time, CO2, was about 17 times higher than it is today. This huge drop in carbon dioxide, and here this huge rise in temperature, we don't know why that happened during a huge drop in carbon dioxide, but this huge drop was because of the advent of forests. Trees comprise about 90% of all living biomass on Earth, so the, the biomass pulled the carbon down out of the atmosphere, and because there were no decomposers that could could decompose cellulose at that time, the trees piled up and formed the coal deposits that we have today. This, this right here marks the end of the coal building era when fungus in particular got enzymes that could digest wood. And so CO2 went back up and then down and then up. I'm more interested in this period. This thing doesn't stay on, it goes off. Can I get another clicker please? Uh, anyways, you can see here as CO2 started to go down, steady, steady, steady down for 140 million years until we caused the uptick at the end, temperature went way up and then went down. If you look at this and look at the relationship between temperature and CO2 for the last 500 million years, I'm sure you will agree that they are not that strongly correlated, never mind indicating a direct cause-effect relationship between the two. Here's the last 65 million years. The Eocene thermal optimum at the top, it was 16 degrees Celsius warmer on this Earth then. Every one of us and all our ancestors came through that. Every living thing on Earth today's ancestors came through that 16 degree higher temperature or we wouldn't be here. 
Then it started to cool and cool and cool. Here, ice, Earth is ice free. Here, the Arctic glaci Antarctic glaciation began, and here, the Arctic glaciation began, the ice on the north. We are in one of the coldest periods in the history of modern life on Earth today, even now in this interglacial period. This is modern times. The IPCC says since 1950, that's here, we are the dominant cause. So they're saying we're the dominant cause of this warming here. I don't know why these things go out when you press them. Uh, but look at the period between 1910 and 1940. It warmed as much there over the same period of time as it did between 1970 and 2000. Yet the IPCC does not say what caused the warming between 1910 and 1940. They are silent on that. So right in the last hundred years, we have a precedent for a warming period that is just as strong and just as much as the one we just went through in the 90s, and yet they say that's mostly caused by us. That is a logical disconnect for me. This is the last 18 years and six months. There has been no significant warming of the Earth's climate, according to the UK Meteorological Office, which brought us ClimateGate. They're very much in the warmest camp, but they have to admit there has been no statistically significant warming for 18 years and six months on this Earth, even though about 25% of all the carbon dioxide we have ever emitted has gone into the atmosphere during this period. This is the United States, 10 years from 2000, uh, 5 to 2014, it's actually cooling in the United States right now. And this is a place in Britain where they've measured the temperature since 1659 with a thermometer. And then there's the carbon dioxide emissions by human beings. Do they look like they're direct cause effect related? No, it's been warming for 300 years since the little ice age peaked in around 1700. And the warming has been steady and even not like the curve of carbon dioxide. You would expect the temperature curve to go up along with the CO2 curve if they were in a lockstep cause-effect relationship. Here is the anomaly of Arctic ice. In the summers of 2007-2012, we saw the lowest extent of summer ice in the Arctic since they started measuring it in 1979, but now it has reconsolidated at a higher, still lower than the average, but at a higher level, but nobody talks about the Antarctic. Well, they do, but they talk about other things than this. The Antarctic has record ice today. This is just from the other day. And that's the summer of 2014, which completely offsets the Antarctic loss. There is no trend in global sea ice area on planet Earth since we started measuring it. The red line on the bottom is the anomaly from the mean. Seven years ago, Al Gore said the ice cap is falling off a cliff. It could be completely gone in the summer in as little as seven years from now. This is the amount of ice that was over these four cities 21,000 years ago. That's climate change. We didn't do it. We didn't melt the ice. It went away by itself. Here's the Vostok ice cores showing the 100,000-year cycle of glaciations here down on the bottom. This is the coldest and then out of the Ice Age quickly into an interglacial period. The one on the right is the one we're in now, showing the increase in CO2 that we've caused at the end. This is caused by the Milankovitch cycle, which is a 100,000-year cycle to do with the Earth's orbit and tilt. It's been going on all through this Pleistocene Ice Age. What's more likely, that the changes of orbit and tilt of the Earth will cause CO2 to rise or will, will cause temperature to fluctuate? See, because what's really going on here, if you come in closer, you can see that carbon dioxide follows temperature, does not lead it. The cause never comes after the effect. The effect usually comes first. The reason CO2 is fluctuating along with temperature is because when the sea warms up, gases come out. When the sea cools down, gases go in. So the temperature is causing the change in CO2, not the other way around. Note that CO2 fell to 180 parts per million 18,000 years ago. That is only 30 parts per million above the level where plants start to die at 150 ppm. We don't only need CO2 in the atmosphere for life on Earth. We need 150 or more parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere for life on Earth. This is the sea level rise since the end of the glaciation. Note for the last 8,000 years, it's gone up slow, and steady, but nothing like it did 
when it came up nearly 400 feet as the huge glaciers on the land melted. This is the hurricane activity, tropical cyclone activity. It is not increasing. As a matter of fact, it's at a quiet state right now. This is the droughts that occurred in California. This is when the cliff dwellers, the Anasazi, disappeared back in 800, 900, 1000 AD. That may have been the reason. It's wetter in California now than it was back then. This is the greening of the earth, what's called the CO2 fertilization effect. This work was done by the top science body in Australia, the CSIRO, and yet hardly anybody talks about this. In fact, the increase in CO2 that we've put in the atmosphere is causing a huge increase in global biomass because plants want 1,000 to 2,000 ppm for their optimum growth. This is why greenhouse growers around the world either put the exhaust from their heaters into the greenhouse or buy bottled CO2 to put it in the greenhouse to raise the CO2 up to double or triple what it is in the atmosphere. All the plants on Earth today, even with this elevated level that we've put in, are still starvation diet for CO2. Clouds are truly the wild card in climate change because water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas, way more important than carbon dioxide, but water is the only greenhouse gas that is in all three states, gas, liquid, solid, in the atmosphere, and clouds are the liquid part. So the, the division between the water vapor as a gas and water vapor as a liquid could either be a negative or positive feedback to the other greenhouse gases. It's impossible to do this in a computer. But Joni Mitchell did it. She said, I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow, it's clouds illusions, I recall, we really don't know clouds at all. <laughs> CO2 is the most important food for all life on Earth. This has to be turned completely on its head, this idea that CO2 is a toxic pollutant, and even the Pope's buying into it now. It is not a toxic pollutant. It is the gas of life. It is the staff of life. It is the stuff of life. It is the currency of life. It is what we are all made of, and every other living thing on Earth is made of. It's crazy to call it a pollutant. This is the carbon cycle and where all the carbon is. This much carbon's in the atmosphere, 70 times as much as in the sea, and goes back and forth between the sea and the atmosphere on a regular basis. Plants and soils contain more carbon than there is in the whole global atmosphere. The fossil fuels contain so much more. This is sequestered carbon. Talk about carbon capture and storage. That's exactly what plants did when they made the fossil fuels. And the Earth's crust contains 100 million billion tons of carbon in the form of limestone, chalk, marble, and other carbonaceous rocks, all of which are life origin. How could 100 million billion tons of living things end up in rocks like this? This is a life-size mock-up of an ammonite that they were exterminated by the... Uh, asteroid. At 2,000 ppm, this was living in the ocean. Ocean acidification is a complete fabrication and is chemically impossible to occur. These are coccolithophores. Here, a, a phytoplankton, seashells, coral reefs, and foraminifera, which is an animal, all learned how to make armor plate for themselves by combining calcium and carbon dioxide in the sea to make calcium carbonate. That's what the 100 million billion tons of carbon in the rocks is. They've been sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and got it down to 180 ppm at the height of the last glaciation, nearly enough to kill all life on Earth. And it's been going down steadily for 140 million years. And if we hadn't come along and put some of that carbon back in the atmosphere, life would have extinguished itself in a very short time geologically from now. World energy production, mostly fossil fuel, they say we should go to zero emissions. I translate that into zero human beings. Fossil fuels are 100% organic, produced with solar energy, and when burned, produce food for life. It is the largest storage of solar energy on Earth by far. Greenpeace's fossil fuel dilemma, they say this ship is driven by super efficient electric motors and sails It will be powered by the wind. There's a 4,000 horsepower diesel engine in the basement of that boat. And they attack a Russian oil rig with an oil-powered ship, saying we must end our addiction to oil. And then when they tie up at the dock, they get fueled up by British petroleum. 
you'd think they'd use biodiesel. No, they're against, actually against biodiesel and against all biofuels. They say it takes too much land to grow the plants to make them and that land should be used for wilderness or whatever. They're just against bloody well everything. Okay, in my last 32 seconds, I'm going to wind up with where all the oil comes from for all our cars. It comes from places like this. And they use nasty pictures to get people to think the world is being destroyed. This is oil sands mining in Canada, but you know, the oil sands are there. There's Edmonton, you can see it too. When are they going to reclaim Edmonton, or Toronto, or Los Angeles, or New York, and put it back to wilderness again? Never. But this is reclaimed mine site at the oil sands. Every square meter of the oil sands must be reclaimed. The bison managed by McKay First Nations, the oil sands employs more First Nations and First Nations corporations than any other industry in Canada. This is a reforested area reclaimed from active mining, and God forbid there might be a timber harvest there one day. Good enough for me. This is sustainable. No one has to touch it or fertilize it or do anything with it. It'll grow back by itself into a boreal forest with all native species. And the only reason I got involved in this, because I, I didn't really want it be people to be able to say, oh, you're working for the fossil fuel industry, because I never had. But when I saw how Canada was being besmirched in our friendly neighbors and countries in Europe, in the capitals of those places, as being this terrible place where all this awful stuff was happening, when we have the best civil rights in the world, the best human rights in the world, the best labor laws in the world, and the best environmental regulations in the world, it's not right for people to be demonizing us for providing them with the oil for their cars. One billion cars, half a million airplanes, and all the buses and trucks in this world, if they didn't start tomorrow, civilization would come to a screeching halt. My book, Confessions of a Greenpeace Dropout, will be available upstairs afterwards, and thank you very much.